Some time ago I did a video on making this shadow box to display and demonstrate my pair of evil mad scientist ultra large or extra large 555 and 741 ICs that are built out of discrete components. As a refresher, the 741 is one of the earlier uh, popular integrated circuit op amps and the 555 is of course uh, an extremely common, probably the most common IC produced ever uh, with all of its various timing related functions. Anyway, I had set this shadow box up to allow these to be demonstrated in situ uh, and I have separate power buttons for the 555 and for the 741 circuits and then I have the 741 op amp configured as a, a gain stage, um, a 1 to 2 uh, gain stage and the input adjust knob varies an input voltage uh, above and below circuit common or zero volts and then because I wasn't able to find any metering devices that would fit the space at least not ones with any resolution um, I just went with um, probe tip jacks for the inputs and outputs where a couple of multimeters could be plugged in and I always hated that solution but it's all I could think of at the time and now I have what may be a better solution I found a couple of uh, meter types made by Laskar Electronics um, Chinese firm I think they actually have quite a lot of products they have a, a US um, presence though with a an East Coast office to sell and support their products and um, this is the model SP 400 EBW and it's just a variant on the basic SP 400 uh, it's a small multimeter assembly that's designed to be panel mounted I bought these from DigiKey. There's the DigiKey info. Their part number. This is the actual meter. And uh, then there's a. This is like a reverse bezel ring. And this is a. Uh, rubber gasket and there's a spring clip so those are all for mounting it in a panel it has a nine pin header and uh, kind of a ratchet structure on the side which I believe is what this goes into whichever way it's designed to mount to uh, hold it up to the uh, panel and then it has its own little bezel I'm hoping I think there is room on the shadow box to put a couple of these either right next to each other or one above the other and if there isn't I can use just one and use a toggle switch to switch it between the input and output voltages that are being monitored but I really want to have them both on there I have uh, 
already sketched up sort of a, a mini manual from studying the the data sheet and um, there's a number of ways you can configure it to have uh, there's uh, power supply common and circuit common or signal common and they can be uh, isolated or electrically commoned and that's what I think one of those uh, pads on the back is for and then there's a uh, provision for the uh, low battery functionality the op amp circuit that I'm using in the shadow box is powered by a pair of 9 volt batteries with the alternate action push on push off power switch breaking both the V plus and the V minus and then this dashed line here just represents the op amp circuit V plus and V minus and circuit common and then there's the input voltage and the output voltage so um, the way I want to use this is I'm going to have this configured such that the meters V plus is the only power supply it needs. It can be configured so that it runs off of a bipolar power supply but in that case there's issues with um, I think the V plus and V minus are not centrally spanned from the circuit common if you do that there's some sort of a gotcha to doing it that way uh, but if you have it configured the way I have it then there's an internal circuit in the meter which will generate its own V minus which it does need for operation but it will generate it from the V plus if you have it configured this way so I figured to just use the positive or V plus side of the power supply run it through a couple of diodes and into the V plus of the meter only and the diodes are there because in this particular power supply configuration I think it's a maximum of 7 volts that can be applied to the the V plus something along those lines and um, or maybe it's 7.6 or something uh, and I figured with the uh, three diodes actually I drew two but I was going to put three in it was going to drop the nine volts to about six point nine volts which was under the maximum V plus so it's just a voltage dropper um, and simpler than trying to do something with a, a voltage regulator and it doesn't care exactly what the voltage is as long as it's not uh, more than whatever the maximum seven point whatever uh, and then the 47 ohm resistor from BL minus to circuit ground is the return path for the backlight the LED backlight for the LCD so that gives you the desired uh, brightness at the voltage I'm planning on using and then the input low in this case is tied to circuit common so the power supply and the circuit common are the same and that's why um, this L com pad is not installed uh, because I'm doing it this way um, and then the uh, the input high INH is connected to either the op amp input or output circuit but it's it can be scaled to different voltages but it really only can work with um, I think 0.2 volts um, and you have to scale the input voltage down since I can have a swing of almost 10 volts above or below ground uh, I needed to get that below 0.2 volts so that's a factor of a hundred so I have a 
1 meg to 10k voltage divider made with a couple of resistors and then that uh, knocks it down to the requisite span that the meter can handle. So what I want to do here is before I start carving up the shadow box I want to make sure the meter works the way I understand it to work. Okay I have a hastily lashed together rig with three 1N4004 diodes just out of my parts bin a 1 meg and a 10k resistor for the input voltage divider a 47 ohm resistor for the backlighting current limiter and I've got the circuit wired up the way I had it on my little sketch I hope uh, right now I have a yellow jumper connecting the input lead to ground or circuit common and the point here is I want to see if these diodes really limit the input voltage the way I think they do or that they need to so I'm starting out with my bench power supply set to 7 volts and I'm going to plug the meter in see if it's working and then um, raise the voltage on the power supply while monitoring the voltage at the V plus pin of the meter with my meter there to see if it stays within the uh, desired voltage range. Alright, I think everything is good there. Um, I don't think I've got anything shorting out. I'm going to turn the power supply on. And I get a nice zero volt readout. And I'm measuring 4.8 volts into the meter. I'm going to crank my uh, power supply up until it's 9 volts and I'm getting 6.7 volts which is close to the 6.9 volts I predicted. So now I have to introduce an input voltage. I have my function generator set up to generate a 50 millihertz uh, ramp wave form um, with a 18 volt peak to peak or plus and minus 9 volt uh, uh, voltage <laughs> and just to check it on my scope I've got it set up with uh, 5 volts per division and 0 volts in the vertical center So there it is at zero, and it's going up. It's five volts, six, seven, eight, nine volts. Come back down. Minus five. Yep, about minus nine volts. So it's doing what I expect. Now I just have to connect that to the meter. I'm going to release the clip that's grounding the signal and hook it up there One thing I want to check is what the viewing angle is. I don't have much positive viewing angle. It starts going to pot pretty quickly if I'm up about here, but once I get down to there it's okay. And if I'm actually down pretty far below it, it's okay too. And it has a pretty good side viewing angle, so I think it'll be okay on the shadow box. Looks like it's working perfectly to me. It should do exactly what I want. The um, meter with its backlighting is drawing 36 milliamps. 
and um, I probably should do some sort of calculation to see if the 9 volt batteries I've got powering the 741 op amp circuit can run a couple of these so let's say it's 40 say it's 80 milliamps um, how much life can I expect to get out of a 9 volt battery at 80 milliamps the shadow box is powered by this kind of battery it's a Duracell standard Duracell 9 volt it's their part number MN 1604 and um, looking at their data sheet for the MN1604 online it's an alkaline manganese dioxide battery and even though it's got that part number it shows it with the Duralock on there which I thought was a different part number to get that um, so they don't tell you directly here what the milliampere hours where that would be nice They've got a bunch of charts. Um, I'd rather they just said what the milliampere hours were. Well, I'm going to go with constant current. Somewhere between 50 and 100 milliamps. I've got about 80. So it's going to be in between these two curves. I know the circuit can power down to at least 6.5 after the diodes. And considerably lower, actually. Because I've already tested it. Um, so let's see the battery here well I know the meter can run off of 7 volts before the batteries so um, if I'm in between the green and purple curves and I can tolerate it running at 7 volts um, I'm going to put 80 milliamps right around here if this is the 100 milliamp curve and this is the 50 milliamp curve let's say it's about here and that suggests that it'll run for five hours that way I'm only going to turn this on very occasionally and only for you know a minute or two at a time so five hours is quite a lot in this application so I think we'll be fine Okay, I'm just going to take this guy off the wall with its magnetic hanger. I was trying to remember and remind myself how this was built and so it has the acrylic window that just covers the entire thing and then it has glued onto that a uh, 16th inch thick aluminum panel for strength and then the uh, printed overlay glued onto that um, so that's all essentially part of the acrylic panel then I'm obviously going to have to replace the acrylic panel uh, in order to do any changes to this area and that's okay okay the blue tape shows about where the partition comes to that's a quarter inch thick and it's just underneath the lip of this so um, you know about like that maybe a little further down um, so it definitely looks like there's room for the two of these going um, one above the other but it might be nice to have them go side by side. I think that'll actually look better. It'll be more structurally sound and more intuitive with the input and the output left to right. And that's kind of in line with the old graphics I have. I like that better. And it doesn't get too close to the top and bottom and leaves more material in between the two meters. Um, and I can actually inch those over a little bit to the left if I need to to get more clearance around the pot. The other thing I need to verify is how much vertical clearance I actually have. Is there any issue with 
uh, the meters and their connectors. I'm thinking those aren't much different than the depth of these pin jacks, but uh, I need to make sure they're not going to hit the batteries or the other uh, connectors or wiring inside and prevent this from going together. Well, the batteries, including a conservative overage, take up about one inch down from the top of the uh, the subframe. So things do look a little close in there. So the batteries go almost all the way down to that mark. And then from the inside of the panel up to that part is just a bit over two inches. Okay. Now the gasket slipped again. Okay, from the inside of the gasket is uh, about three quarters of an inch. So there is clearance. It'll be tight. Um, I won't probably be able to have any wires looping around. They'll have to maybe be laced to come down closer to the meter bodies. And I'm probably going to have to use something that's not at all stiff wiring. Maybe even the, the wire wrap wire for something like this, even though I hate to flex it around too much, lest it break, but um, if I can get that put together and um, you know put it in once without the wires breaking, I shouldn't have to open it up very often. And what I'm really concerned about is all this stiff wiring I have in there already, but it's it's actually stranded wire so it, it can move around and go a little one way or the other and actually it can almost go um, over this way some more especially if I choose to extend these two wires so that this connector can go over the pot then there won't be nearly so much um, Actually, a lot of this wiring will go away. All this white wiring that goes to the jacks won't even be there. So I have to imagine that space is being totally clear. So I could have one meter here. It'll still clear the pot. And the other meter... Actually, I can go over even more than that. Probably about like this. And there will be plenty of clearance here, plenty of clearance here. I don't have to move where the pod is or the power switches. I think that's uh, exactly what it needs to be. All right, I've penciled out the schematic for both sides, the detachable base plate with the batteries and the 741 and 555 circuits. And then the, uh, the top part, or front part, with again its disconnectable header, the power switches, the potentiometer, and the input and output jacks. So this is the header, this is everything on the front panel, this is everything on the base. And it's as I expected it would be. The batteries all run on their positive or negative sides. Uh, well positive side normally, everything except the uh, common, runs through a power switch on the front panel, comes back, um, and then runs to their respective 555 or 741 circuits. Uh, the common between the plus 9 and minus 9 supplies for the 741 doesn't go through the switch, it just daisy chains to the two uh, jacks, input and output, negative sides, and then continues the daisy chain on back through the connector and all the way out through the ribbon cable to the 741. And meanwhile, the uh, positive and negative switched sides, besides running back to the 741, 
also power the uh, potentiometer on its plus and minus sides um, and the wiper daisy chains over to the input positive pin jack before continuing to the header and onto the uh, input of the 741 and the output of the 741 comes back goes through the last pin on the header and goes to the output pin jack so again exactly what I expected to see I just wanted to refresh my memory and make sure that it was all accurate now I have to see uh, how that's going to work out for the new circuit make sure I'm not short any pins that I'll need alright I've penciled out the uh, the new circuit it only affects the uh, the front circuit of the shadow box not the the base circuit that's unchanged the header itself is unchanged I've tried to reuse all existing wiring coming off the header except in order to reposition this plug I'm going to have to replace those two wires those are for the 555 timer circuit um, so they'll be the same just longer and then all the other wires coming off of here going to the power switches or the power switch for the 741 to the top and bottom of the potentiometer and the other signals will all be I think existing wiring I think it'll all reach but it all has to be re-terminated at some sort of an auxiliary circuit board I'm going to make up and um, I haven't decided yet if I'm going to try to etch this uh, or just make it a piece of perf board there's relatively few components on it but I might want to do it with a circuit board I'll have to hunt around and see if I can find my little pieces of uh, clad uh, fiberglass or phenolic board um, I can probably whip one up it doesn't have to be precise anyway it'll have on it the three uh, diodes in series which are for voltage dropping of the power supply it'll have the two sets of voltage divider uh, resistors on it and it'll have the two backlighting current limiting resistors on it and it'll handle power distribution so I have minimal um, possible distortion of the signals due to current uh, supplied to the backlighting current supplied to the meter circuit and the actual signal path although I can't completely segregate them uh, without doing something very elaborate up here and I don't really need to it worked fine um, with the old scheme having the uh, pin jacks for auxiliary meters uh, working there all I'm really adding here is the loads um, of the uh, the meters I want to keep those separate as much as possible from the signal wiring it's just good practice again the currents are pretty low here and it probably wouldn't really make any difference but I can use a star uh, topology here uh, and uh, break those up in such a way that the higher current path doesn't share more wiring than necessary with the lower current path and then uh, coming off that same auxiliary board there will be five wire wrap wires I want to keep them as small and uh, light as possible and <clears throat> the um, female headers that plug into the back and by the way those do not come with the meters those are just things I had on hand um, except for one jumper from one to seven on there all the other wires will be soldered to come down alongside the header and I'll bundle all five wires next to each other and put a blob of epoxy on there as a strain relief so that it doesn't stress the solder joints on there uh, so when I plug and unplug them I'm not potentially breaking those wires and then the other ends of those wires will terminate at the auxiliary circuit board so that should be pretty good there's minimal uh, wiring mass doing it this way and uh, if I can move this more over here and that's my goal I want to be able to lace this up uh, over more 
by the potentiometer and that will be allowed by this. It can be kind of like this and then the only thing you've got here is a little wiring laying over the top of the batteries and that shouldn't present a problem. It's all pretty loose and lightweight. Flexible wiring. Um, it can come up and press on the back of the meters and it won't make any difference. And then the other wires around here I want to put the auxiliary board probably down around here somewhere and uh, then all these white wires coming off the pot and so on have enough length to reach over to the to that auxiliary board. Um, so I think that'll be pretty good actually. It should work out pretty well. Um, I just need to now sit down and figure out exactly where I want to mount these meters in there and then hopefully I save the file for the uh, front panel express graphics. I usually do save those things and it's probably on my computer. In that case I can just uh, uh, make a copy of that for this version and um, remove the pin jacks and put in the two meters side by side with appropriate graphics over them. I removed the shims that hold the subframe centered and now I can just lift it out of there. That's another of the reasons why it works out so well to have the front panel wiring and the rest of the wiring separatable by a plug. It just makes it that much easier to work on this. And it's also clear here, something that I had forgotten how I put this together, was that the acrylic does just sit in the frame and then the aluminum reinforcing plate which is the real front panel just sits within the lip uh, it doesn't continue over over the lip it just goes up to the lip uh, and I was pretty sure that's the way it was but I couldn't remember for certain so it just sits in there and um, because that's the way it is, and the subframe isn't holding anything in place anymore, I can now just lift this out. And um, work on it. So basically I need to get a new piece of acrylic because I'm going to be re-drilling it. And actually maybe I don't even have to when it comes down to it. Uh, but I'm pretty sure that I glued the aluminum to the acrylic. Yeah, I'm going to have to replace it. Uh, I don't see any good way to remachine that. The sorry thing about that is that at least with these switches I'm gonna to have to desolder the wiring from it which sucks <laughs> uh, they're not designed to uh, come apart here you have to unwire them if you want to remove them from the panel and since they're solder types that's inconvenient the potentiometer will be no problem actually I'm thinking of making a bracket um, that goes under there which will support that uh, little sub circuit board I was planning on making and then these jacks will come out. I've designed my little auxiliary circuit board and I have a piece of um, fiberglass single-sided copper clad board and uh, it's going to be one and a half by one inches. There's a little keep clear area for the mounting bracket It'll occupy that space, so I've laid out the pattern, and this is just quick and dirty, so I've tapped the back side with a uh, pen wherever there's a hole, and uh, I'm not going to be doing actual pads, I'm just going to be doing big wide traces with a sharpie pen that didn't happen to include those spots, so I'm just doing that so um, I can cut this out, flip it over, and make a little pin prick 
in the in the copper so I can keep track of the hole locations. I'm going to clean the oxidation and oils and stuff off the copper with a little bit of a scotch brite pad. I've just marked with a uh, narrow sharpie the location of the holes from the pin pricks I've made uh, with my center punch, but I didn't actually use the punch. And then I um, use the reverse foil pattern to just do a thin line. Now I'm going to use the standard so-called fine point sharpie to fill in most of the copper and leave just uh, the minimum amount to be etched away. And there is the board with the etch resist drawn on, crudely but effectively. I've got my ferric chloride. I poured a little bit into a Pyrex dish over a heating pa uh, plate. I don't actually want to get this very hot. It's just to warm it up a little bit. Um, I used to use anhydrous ferric chloride, which would be dry powder, and you'd mix that with water, and it would get hot just in the process of mixing it. If you used it right afterwards, you didn't need to heat it up for best results. But once I get this warmed up, then I'll dunk the board in. You can probably already see the steam coming off. It heats up very quickly on this hot plate. I actually let it get too hot, now I have to let it cool off a bit. So I just have the board in there, and I agitate it a bit. With this elevated temperature, it should go very fast. Okay. Looks like the copper's been etched away. Now I just have to wash it and then use some acetone to remove the uh, etch resist from the Sharpie pen. Okay, it's dried off. Now for the acetone. Okay, very crude board but made quickly. Now I have to uh, flip it over and tape on. All right. My sketch is taped to the non-clad side of the board. I've double checked for approximate alignment. I've got my smallest drill bit chucked up into my Tamaya uh, handy drill or whatever they call this thing. I did a YouTube video on this. Electric handy drill. This is the first time I've actually tried using this to drill a circuit board, but I think it'll work pretty well. Okay, holes drilled. It looks like for the most part they came out on foil. A couple places they're kind of on the edge, but that's fine. Now I have to remove the tape and the paper and clean the copper one more time. I did a quick Sharpie pen job to mark the component values. And now to solder it up. Okay, there's the circuit board. Um, obviously no wires are soldered to it yet, but all the components are on it. Came out about like I expected. And I decided to just solder tin the um, the foils so they have a pretty rough texture as a result of that, but um, everything's soldered up just fine. So I've pulled up the original front panel design in uh, Front Panel Express's free front panel designer software. Um, this is the version of the artwork that I originally created. Uh, I'd created two versions, I should say, for the original front panel, one with outlines and another one without outlines because I didn't actually want the outlines to print. But it was useful for spacing things. I took that version and modified it here for the version with meters. And um, I removed the four jacks that were in this area. I left the input and output, but I repositioned them and put them in line with the input adjust line 
since it was about correctly spaced. And instead of drawing an outline for the meter cutouts, I just put four tick marks uh, as if they were drill marks at the corners of where the cutouts will be. And then this one here is a little bit higher and it's only a one millimeter bezel so it's only one millimeter higher here and I just put that to indicate where the top of the the bezel will be make sure it wasn't getting too close to the text as it is there's plenty of room so now I have it saved and I'm going to make a um, new save as version I'm going to do save it without the outlines so now I got to um, get rid of that get rid of that and get rid of that I'm not sure if I want to get rid of this one or not I probably should I don't remember what prints. I think these holes don't print. Um, I gotta check that out and see if they do or don't. So I'm gonna save it this way and just do a print on my laser printer. Um, Yeah, okay, it does leave the cross hatches indicating the location of holes. And that's fine for the big switch positions and the potentiometer position. Um, I have to double check and see what the diameter of the knob is, if that will cover that up or not. Um, because that circle by itself might be a good uh, drill location. But I will have to um, get rid of these. I'll print a version um, that doesn't have the cross hatches on it, or the, the uh, crosses rather. That'll be the actual artwork, but I'll have a version that does have these because they'll be good locations to make uh, you know, pilot drill holes, that type of thing. Okay, I have my rough print out. I've cut it out with my X-Acto knife. I just want to make sure that the dimensions I have are correct for these meters. Okay. I think that'll be fine. Of course, I can't have those um, intersection lines showing. Those will definitely need to be deleted before I uh, print this out for real. But at least the dimensions are correct. They pop through perfectly, and um, I need to now check and see if this dot will be covered up. Here's the old panel, and I can clearly see that I did print it with that circle, and that the knob does cover it up, so I can leave this one on there. That solves that dilemma, so now I have to print this for real without these intersection dots and that'll also take away these other ones but I also need to print another copy of this one that I can use to put like a center punch or something it'll be a cut pattern for when I actually cut out the aluminum and plexiglass the way I'll do this as I did with this one is I'll cut out the structural elements with drills and in this case my scroll saw I think and then I will adhere the photo or the um, the final version on the quality print to last paper to the structural element and then cut through it using the exacto knife to match the cutouts that are already there that way I can assure alignment My regular um, 
laser printer doesn't usually lay down as dense a pattern of pure black or any color really so I tend to use my color laser in presentation paper mode like this and it gives me a nice solid black pattern that looks good so I've got that done now and the only intersection lines I left were the ones for the actual holes, circular holes, and not the uh, the corner marks for the square cutouts or the rectangular cutouts. And this is on 3M print to last paper. I'm still chewing away at my fairly large stock of that I acquired before it was discontinued. And while I'm on this subject, this is the nearest I found to the Kodak or 3M print to last paper. This is a Xerox product. It's called Revolution Never Tear. This is uh, the part number of the version I buy. It's 5 mil, which is approximately the same as the 3M print to last paper. It's a white mat, just like the 3M product. A hundred sheet pack, and it's not too expensive. But again, it's a, a laser printable. Uh, nearly indestructible printable plastic that uh, uh, is I guess it has some sort of a porous nature to it so that the toner sort of cooks down into the pores and therefore you can't just scrape it off the surface it makes the printing very durable and the paper itself and the toner are impervious to a lot of things, oils, dirt, water, and so on. So it's a very good um, product for this type of thing. And I've found it invaluable for everything from making little key caps that are going to get a lot of attention from the fingers to front panels like this. Anything that's going to get a lot of uh, handling or uh, physical stress that regular papers wouldn't handle. So I have a sheet of uh, 3 seconds inch thick acrylic uh, plexiglass with its protective coating on here and I've got my acrylic scoring knife and my straight edge. I've laid my old, soon to be abandoned, front window for the shadow box on there and marked off the dimensions. So I now have to score this and then I usually just break it over the edge of the uh, the table extension on my table saw.
it's hard to break off those little little pieces. A lot of people say you should remove the protective film before you cut this and that's generally going to make it easier. However, I don't like the chance of getting it scratched up so I do tend to try to cut the film and then score it. And That's not an exact science but it does work. Anyway, so I've got that cut now. I need to uh, clean it up just a little bit. I still have um, a couple of little spots here that I want to clean up. I just need to make sure that this fits into the frame that it's not too large. It does seem like it's just about right, just a hair big. Sometimes it'll go in easier the other way. Nope, it's just a hair big. I need to take it down. I can sand that off to make it fit. Alright, that fits in there nicely now. I think it'll fit the other way around too. It's nice to know if it's compatible in all orientations. Sometimes if the frame isn't absolutely square it won't be, but this does seem to be fitting any old which way I put it in there. That's good. So, um, now I have to cut out the aluminum piece. I usually buy my smaller pieces of aluminum at the Ace Hardware. The uh, K&S Precision Metals is the brand they use for all of their angle stock. They have brass and copper and aluminum and steel. <clears throat> and this is one of the things they always seem to have in stock is the um, 0 0.064 by 4 inches by 10 inches. And of course the 0 0.064 is just a hair bigger than 1 16th inch. It's essentially 1 16th inch thick. So I've got to mark this and cut it on my sheet metal shear to the desired, um, <clears throat> what did I figure it was? It was eight inches by two and five eighths. Eight inches by two and five eighths I need. Pieces marked for cutting.
so that came out right on the money. <clears throat> now I need to verify, let's see, yes, I had keyed this frame to be two little holes there for the top, so I can always remember the orientation. And um, I'm going to define this similarly with two holes to uh, keep it oriented. I've taped my um, paper pattern down and use my center punch for the four holes and I've traced the cutout lines that I used for testing the fit to the aluminum so I think the next thing to do is to peel the acrylic off of just the part of the front where I'm going to be sticking this on and then stick on the aluminum then take it over to my scroll saw and my drill press and cut out the holes just in the aluminum and the plexiglass. The aluminum should support the plexiglass a little bit in that. If there's any cracking of the plexiglass it'll be hidden by the aluminum which is the real structural element. And then um, I'll put it on the scroll saw and you know cut the, the square parts out. Only then when that's all done and I've file these holes to make sure they fit properly with the meters. I'm going to make them a little bit undersized if I can um, and then um, file them till they just fit the meters. Only then will I put on the spray adhesive and adhere the actual front panel to the aluminum and then I can cut the holes through using the holes in the aluminum as the guide and I'll use my X-Acto knife for that. I couldn't remember what I used to make these holes for the push button switches. It's sort of an odd size. Close to 5 eighths, just a hair bigger. The hole seems pretty clean. I don't think I just hogged it out with my Dremel tool, but I've gone through my collection of bits and I'm just stymied. I can't find a hole punch or a hole saw or anything of the right size, except for this 5 8 uh, spade bit which um, strangely enough was laying on the top of the uh, pile of spade bits I re so rarely use them anymore uh, so I might have used that and as a test I just punched through the aluminum and plexiglass from the old shadow box window and it did go through I had to do it in two or three stabs and clear the bit in between but it did go through the aluminum and the plexiglass all right um, so I could use that, but it's possible I used a Forstner bit too. Um, hmm. I may try that out and see which works better. Well, the hole fits a 16 millimeter Forstner bit almost exactly, so I'll try that to see how it goes with this uh, scrap piece. That didn't work at all. The Forstner bit wouldn't even start on the aluminum. So that's out. I think I'll go back to the 5 8 inch spade bit. Okay, I've got my aluminum panel face down, and I've got a can of 3M Super 77 spray adhesive which I think is what I used the last time. I haven't used spray adhesive since I did the shadow box the first time around and this was conspicuously forward of the other spray adhesives on the shelf so I think that's what I used. That uh, fuzzy surface is the adhesive sprayed on there. Naturally it's all 
tacky on there. I have the plexiglass marked. This is the front side of the plexiglass. I have it marked for where I want to lay that down. There's a little slot there, but not much. I just remembered what I used. I used this uh, large size step drill. That is what I used. Forgot all about that, but luckily I haven't done the drilling yet. I've just stuck the aluminum on. I'm waiting half an hour before starting to drill the holes. Uh, cheap Chinese Harbor Freight Special, which is the only Harbor Freight tool I have except for my um, bench sander there. <clears throat> Everything else has been replaced with better stuff. But the hole in the table isn't centered with the spindle, so as you get larger bits like this, you can't go far enough in to support the work. So, for that I need to have a sacrificial piece with a, uh, a hole drilled through it that can support the work up close to the hole, but still allow the, the uh, big part to go through. Alright, I've made a clearance hole in my sacrificial board. Well, hopefully this will work out, or it could be a big disaster. up when I do that. I want to let it cool off, so I'm going to alternate work on the two holes that I have to make this big. step at a time.
because the thickness of the material is more than the step height, I have to go through and clean it up on the other side. like the adhesive is not let loose, which was something I was worried about from the heat, but it has not let loose, so that's good. And uh, I'm comparing the holes to the originals, and that's looking just like what it should be. Good deal. So I have this hole, this hole, and this hole that were done with the step drill. This was just done with a small, regular twist drill, and um, I need to open these two up a little bit to admit the blade for the, uh, the scroll saw, or the jigsaw, whatever we're calling it. I think it's a scroll saw. going well, but the blade is bowed slightly. I'll fix that if I can. Slightly better. One rectangular hole cut, one more to go. Now these are undersized, I hope, <laughs> just on the off chance that I cut these too big. Nope. They're all just a little undersized. It'll take some bit of filing to get these to fit. But with such a tiny overlap on the bezel, I need it to be a very tight fit. Okay, after letting the glue set up for a couple hours and going to work with a file, straightening up the slightly irregular lines from the scroll saw and squaring up the corners, now the 
foot meters drop in just about perfectly. No slot, but they don't have to be forced in either. So that's finally fit. I actually need to flip this over and make sure they go all the way through. I think they do, but since I was only testing shallow from the front, nope, that works. That'll go in. So um, now I have to attach the decorative front. The uh, glue let up a little bit during the filing. Um, but only just along here, it seems to be adhering everywhere else. And once the switches are in here, it doesn't really need the glue anyhow. So I have to now prepare my higher quality print to last paper version and set that down on here. Um, let that dry overnight. Now the problem I had with the first one, as I recall doing it, there's a little bit, you can kind of see the bl darker black line right along there, along the edge. That was from the adhesive getting on it. When I spray the adhesive on the back of this, a uh, little bit bounced off the backing paper and uh, or the drop cloth and got on the front and I couldn't wipe it off. I'm actually seriously considering masking this off and spraying this, but then I would get adhesive in all these holes that I really don't want it in. That would just make a mess of things. So I think I'll still put adhesive on here. I just need to do a better job of um, holding it down. I might actually put a couple of small weights on it or something to see if I can get it to uh, set a little bit flatter on the uh, drop cloth. To make sure I get optimal registration with the cosmetic panel, with everything else in place, I've stuck the acrylic in with the aluminum plate, the subframe, and all the shims, which will hold it together pretty well, I think, for this step. I've made sure that the aluminum does fit forward in here. Looks like it does. So I need to uh, verify that when I lay this in here, it's in line with the top of the aluminum. Even if it doesn't completely cover this little gap at the bottom, I can hit that with a Sharpie pen and disguise it. But it'll show a lot more if I lower it down and reveal the aluminum. That's just a small difference in the width of the two and how it fits into the frame. So I have to make sure when I lay it down that it's uh, aligned with the top rather than the bottom. Okay, that's put down now. I'm going to let it dry overnight. Tomorrow I'm going to get the X-Acto knife out and cut out the uh, holes through to the cutouts in the aluminum end plexiglass and then just mount the uh, old hardware on there and the meters and start doing the wiring. Time to start cutting. And there we go. I've drilled a clearance hole here for a 440 bolt. And uh, that'll come up from behind the knob on this pot. I had it positioned to, uh, let's see, yeah. So this bracket here would still clear the nut, or the, not the nut, but the, um, ah, what to call it, the uh, flange here, and still um, come up at the right place 
to provide a mount for the circuit board here. There's the uh, top of that screw and the knob will cover it up. I've been struggling with how to mount these meters. into the holes. The way they're designed to work is with a gasket, which I don't need, and a spring clip. And you may actually be able to use the spring clip by itself, come to think of it. And then this thing, this little frame which pushes down over it, and these are little ratchet teeth down here that bite into these little ratchet bridges here and you just push it down until it gets tight and then you can um, push down on these tabs or lift up on these tabs I guess and disengage the teeth just enough to pull it off if you need to replace the meter but with the limited space I've got here you can see that this won't work I don't have nearly enough room between the meters and also it would hit the pot over on this side and it would come really close to hitting the switch on this side. So I can't use that. Um, I thought of all sorts of arrangements where I could put a, another item glued onto here, for example, another uh, plate that would uh, have little thumb screws in it or little uh, set screws that would screw into the sides of this and hold it. And uh, that's okay, but I really didn't want to be gluing something to the back of this. I wasn't sure how strong it would be. And then it occurred to me, um, I have some of this um, eighth of an inch thick craft plywood. It's pretty strong stuff. It has about five plies. And I could cut out a couple of rectangles on here that are um, kind of the shape of these gaskets, except wider and uh, fit to just barely slip around the meters, be really tight on there. You'd have to push them on with a screwdriver or something because they would fit so tightly against the case. And um, I would just put the meters in, set it down on the table, jam those wooden, um, whatever we're calling them, bezels down around it, and that would hold the meters in satisfactorily. I think I'm gonna try doing it that way. All right, I'm going to try cutting out these thin plywood pieces, see if they have enough strength, or if I have to do something else. That might work. Naturally, one's a little looser than the other. Okay, everything's mounted back on there, except for the circuit board, but its bracket is there. And uh, let's see how that looks from the front. Looks pretty good. Okay, hopefully I've got the wiring done correctly. I had to extend these wires so that I could generally try to have this connector more over here instead of right on top of the meters but it's a bunch of springy wire even though it's stranded it's going to be a little hard to keep it where I want it maybe I'll lash one pin to a unused pin over here to help hold it I don't know first thing to do is make sure it works so I've got my little auxiliary circuit board there and along the bottom of it it's wired up to the devices on the front panel except for the meters and then along the top I've got wire wrap wire going down and it's actually wire wrapped onto the short PCB uh, pins of these connectors which are plugged into the meter and just so I don't get them mixed up I've got them 
pin marked for orientation 1 and 9 and in and out. And uh, I've checked with the continuity checker and it all looks good in theory, but the proof is in the pudding. Okay, I'm going to test the 555 first. Push the power button. And nothing's happening. That's not a good sign. Okay, I pushed the power button for the 741. And right now it's reading about twice the value on the output as on the input, which is good. Okay, so I've got zero and zero. If I go up to here, maybe two volts, I've got about four volts on the output. I can go all the way up to about 3.4 volts, 6.6 .6 on the output. I can go down to negative one and I have about minus two on the output. minus two, and I have about minus four on the output. The uh, resistors on the gain stage of the op amp are not precisely set up for two to one, that's why there's a little disparity, but it does seem like the meters are working pretty well. So that's good. Let's see why the 555 isn't working. Okay, uh, it turned out the battery for the 555 circuit was totally dead. I probably left it pushed in at some point and never noticed that the LED was flashing. So looking through the protective film here, you should still be able to see the uh, LED. Sort of. So that circuit's working. So everything's working. The wiring is good. Now I have to see if I can shoehorn all that wiring into the case. Okay, first step, so good. Okay, so far that's going in there all right. just have to flip this part over there and kind of tuck these wires in and force this connector down into this area while trying to get everything else lined up. It'll be fun. So far so good. Now I just have to put in the screws. Okay there it is. I'm trying to get this where there's not so much reflection on the on the window. But unfortunately, it's really hard to avoid the glare. Anyway, the um, five 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 is working. Seven forty one is working. about 1.5 being amplified to 2.9, approximately 3 volts, so 2 to 1. Go down to 1.1 1. 1 volt. One to two approximately. And I can go into the negatives. Minus two point two five approximately. Minus 
minus 2 is about minus 4 on the output. So that's working pretty well.